Hi folks, Ryan Honeyman here from Lyft Economy. Many folks have come to us over the last 10 years and asked, how do I get more involved in creating an economy that works for the benefit of all life? They also ask, what skills and experiences do I need to help make this transition? So three years ago, we created something called the Next Economy MBA to help address this and similar questions. Lyft Economy's Next Economy MBA is an online course that's designed for entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, students, recent graduates, employees, and folks who want to learn more about transformational next economy strategies and businesses. Join the growing alumni network of nearly 250 alumni who've gone through this program and learned essential skills and hopefully built lifelong relationships for catalyzing businesses in the emergent and regenerative economy. So we encourage you to check out our course. You can go to lifteconomy.com slash MBA. The next course, Cohort 7, starts on September 21st, 2021. So once again, go to www.lifteconomy.com slash MBA. And now, on with the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Welcome, Diana. Hi, thank you. I'm excited for a few reasons. One, uh, Diana is uh, an author. She's authored a couple of very important books uh, that I recommend highly, Creating a Life Together and Finding Community. And she's done some incredible work uh, really visiting communities around the world. And I am excited to share um, w- and explore with her some of the aspects of functional communities, why they work, and what happens with conflict. And I want to share in a moment what, how that relates to the next economy. But before we get into that, uh, Diana, I'd love it if you would be willing to, for those who aren't familiar with you or your work, if you could share your your story about kind of what brought you here to this moment. And then also, uh, how do you define intentional community? Because that's at the center of a lot of your work. Thank you. Well, I'll start with how I define it, which I got from people who know far more about it than I did when I first learned. And and so I was really curious and interested about what intentional communities were and um, how people live in them and share their lives together in a cooperative way, in a way that is somewhat different than mainstream American culture, but close enough to, you know, still have jobs and pay taxes and raise kids and do all the things people do. And so I wanted to learn about them. So here is the definition that comes from the Fellowship for Intentional Community, known as the FIC for short, which is a nonprofit organization that um, exists in order to assist people in communities um, have better and more functional communities and to assist people looking for them to know where to find them and how to join them. So this is what the FIC says. It's a group of people who uh, share common interests and values and lifestyle choices, who want to live together or near each other or at least close enough to each other in physical proximity so that they can carry out their common purpose together. So if they carry out a common purpose, they live either all on the same land or they live on closely adjacent land or they live in multiple different apartments in an apartment building or they live in a shared group household in the city or the country or in suburbia. And and sometimes they're living on their own home site with their own house and they own that house and they are just in close cooperation with their neighbors. Sometimes they're all living in one house. Sometimes they're living in different houses, but on the same land they share, urban, rural, and in between. And so there's different kinds. The most commonly widely known kind in the U.S. and Western countries today is called co-housing. And that is where a group of people co-own and co-manage and co-developed sometimes with the developer helping them, uh, created their own neighborhood and then they run their own neighborhood together and they live in mainstream style, beautifully comfortable houses, except they're much, much smaller than your average house. And sometimes they're in townhouse 
style apartment type townhouses with a big house they share as their common house, which they have meals there several times a week. It's optional. And they have meetings and parties and dances and weddings and a kids play area and a laundry room and all that. That's co-housing. It's the most popular, well-known and fastest growing kind of intentional community in the U.S. And then there's eco-villages. They can be urban, rural, or in between. Sometimes, but not often, they are in the form of co-housing, but usually there's some other form of shared ownership. And the purpose of an eco-village is to learn how to live more ecologically, sustainably, and then to share that with others, to share what they're learning about what does work and doesn't work through classes and workshops and tours for the public and interested people. I live in an eco-village. It's called Earth Haven Eco-Village, and it's in the mountains of western North Carolina, not far from the little town of Asheville. And so, or, I mean, rather the small city of Asheville. So I'm living in an eco-village, and I've visited many, but i visited the other kinds, too. A few other kinds of intentional communities are shared group households in cities or small towns. Sometimes the people who live there all co-own the house, but sometimes they're renting from someone who owns the house, or they're renting from a landlord who isn't one of them, but rents to them. Sometimes an artist's collective, such as in New York City. Sometimes um, a rural conference and retreat center where the people who work for the conference and retreat center own the business and together are a community. Um, sometimes rural back-to-the-land homesteading communities, and they differ from rural eco-villages because they're not seeking to have workshops and classes and tours. They're just doing their rural homesteading life and various other kinds, like uh, student housing co-ops and senior housing co-ops and affordable housing co-ops, and these are all various forms of intentional community. So I'm learning all of this about 20 years ago, and I decided that I wanted to um, find out how do you start them. So I called up a bunch of folks that I knew who were starting them and visited them and interviewed them. I had some background as a radio interviewer, so I knew how to interview people and a background as an interviewer for magazine articles, too. So I was gathering data, you know, and uh, then I was interviewing people in communities that had failed. Mm -hmm. And then soon after I started that, I started a little newsletter called Growing Community, sharing what I learned. I was using journalism as a forcing function to to make me learn what I had to write about that I promised readers I would write about in the next quarterly issue. This was a physical mailed paper newsletter. It was that long ago. It was in 1991 and 1992, 1993. And then I got hired by the Fellowship for community to be their part-time editor of the new magazine they had acquired communities magazine and so I became the editor and did that for 14 years and worked for the FIC going to their board meetings which were held twice a year at different communities around the US and Canada so every time I'd go to a community I would interview lots of people about how did you start it and what worked and what didn't work and what do you advise people to do who might want to start their own community I was really interested in how do you start these things. I didn't want to think they all just sprung full grown from mm -hmm. like Athena from the head of Zeus. You're like, oh my God, look, it's suddenly here. Well, how'd you do it? People want to know how to do it. It's kind of mysterious. How do you do it? So anyway, I took the data that I learned from all these informal interviews and from e emailing and calling and writing um, tax accountants and CPAs and lawyers and people on the zoning board. I wanted to find out everything I could, and I wrote Creating a Life Together, Practical Tools to Grow Eco-Villages in Intentional Communities. Uh, the publisher is New Society Publishers in Canada, and it came out in 2003, and it has been translated into eight languages, Hebrew, Russian, Korean, Spanish, French, and English, and German. And that tells me that lots of people worldwide want to know the very same thing. Um, in 2007, I, um, my book came out, my second book called Finding Community, How to Join an Eco-Village or Other Kind of Intentional Community. It's about researching them, finding them, making a good match between your values and your purpose and your lifestyle and what area of the country you want to be in and what the internal community finances of that community are relevant but to yours and how you could make a living there and um, and then how to visit them and be a good guest and 
and, you know, understand the things you need to know to be a good guest. And then the questions to ask, like, who owns the land? And how do you make decisions? And what is your membership process? And do you get your money back when you leave? And all kind of things people need to know to ask when they go to a community. And then how to choose one and join one, and then how to join gracefully. Anyway, those are the two books that I've written. During all that time, I started doing workshops on the very topic of how to start a successful new community. I did them in the U.S. and in Canada, and then I started doing consultations and workshops for current existing communities on how they could solve some of their problems and make their life function a lot better. What I think people should have in community, and I hope you don't mind my saying this right out loud, mm-hmm. is feeling joy mm-hmm. instead of feeling um, apprehensive or exhausted or sometimes mm-hmm. miserable, which can happen. I wanted to know, you know, what works well and what doesn't. What are communities that have solved their problems? What have they done? Mm-hmm. During all this time, I was also really interested in community governance, along with how to make soundproofing between walls and <laughs> how to have make a good income in rural communities and what are the best forms of composting toilet. And all these things interest me, but governance is my most favorite one. So I was teaching and advocating classic traditional consensus, and I was slowly realizing that it wasn't really working in almost every community I found. And it wasn't working, not because consensus isn't a wonderful um, creation of the 1600s Quakers in England, mm-hmm. but because communities generally aren't qualified to use it because they're doing too many things on too many levels with not enough agreement about why they're all there mm-hmm. and what the community is for. So there was a structural conflict of a match between their decision-making and governance method and what they were coming out in lots and lots of conflict in communities as a result of using consensus. Mm -hmm. And about the same time, I began to learn about modified kinds of consensus for intentional communities that worked a whole lot better. And sociocracy, a whole different other governance and self self-governance and decision-making method that came from business in the Netherlands in the 1970s. So through all this time, I've been teaching uh, workshops and doing online courses and um, doing online consultations for groups and speaking at conferences and so on. Just spoke at the West Coast Communities Conference for the second year in a row. This last one was held near Seattle. First one was in San Diego. And I've spoken at co- communities conferences in the U.S. and other countries. And during all that time, I'm slowly learning that I like sociocracy as a governance and decision-making method better than anything I've seen. Mm -hmm. So now I teach that as well. I teach it online. I teach it in workshops. I speak about it in conferences. And and I'm about to write a book, my third book, which will be how it is used in communities and step-by-step how to learn it, how to apply it well in communities, and what can go wrong and sort of troubleshooting guide for what to do if things aren't working out right. So that's a quick story on what I'm doing in the world. Wonderful. Thank you for asking. (laughs) Of course. That was great. And whereas um, in the context of Next Economy now, we do see uh, the way – we have human settlement patterns established and being innovated on for uh, incorporating the idea of more sharing. That was a word I heard you say a bunch and, and the having some of these uh, patterns, co-housing, eco villages, uh, rural uh, community settlements. Um, uh, those patterns are part of the next economy and some of the innovation and transformation of what have been, uh, some of the habits, behaviors, and norms that we might associate with the business as usual economy. It's also true that one of the hallmarks of the next economy is uh, some of the organizations that are conducting commerce, creating goods and services, are also endeavoring to have more democratic and inclusive ownership. And in many ways, uh, it's been our observation that those uh, organizational structures look a lot like a intentional community, uh, people with diverse experience, skills, and backgrounds coming together for a shared purpose and maybe spending a considerable amount of time together, uh, maybe five days a week or maybe seven days a week, maybe not living near each other, but certainly proximally being very in close relation. And this shared purpose 
uh, a lot of the things that you described from your observations that can be dysfunctional and where joy can be elusive uh, show up in these organizations as well. And so I think your work not only is so important for how we think about living together, which again might be the ultimately the bigger problem, and I can imagine eight languages, I can imagine it being translated into 80 or 100 or more languages because it's a, it seems to be a, a human imperative for us to figure out how to live in secular communities where we can be full of joy and connection um, and have that be functional. Uh, it's also true that I'm, I'm wondering if we could focus on some of the things that you see that are aspects of kind of healthy and thriving community, and maybe we can, in just conversation, see how those overlay on, you know, multi-stakeholder cooperatives, community-owned organizations, and some of the types of the structures that people who listen to Next Economy Now are experimenting with and interested in. Um, I, I, I know already that there's going to be a lot of overlap, um, and, and uh, but I'm wondering if maybe you could share with us what makes a community healthy and thriving? What, how, 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 what, when they do work, what makes them work? Oh, thank you. This is one of my favorite questions because I have a lot of thoughts about this one. Um, and I first of all want to say I completely agree that member-led groups like worker co-ops or owner co-ops or political or environmental action groups where the members themselves lead it and there's not a one-boss autocratic top-down hierarchical structure, but we, the folks in the organization, co-lead it. The things that will work in intentional communities will certainly work for them. Therefore, the things that make a healthy, thriving, intentional community, I think, will make a healthy, thriving, member-led group. And just uh, to make a quick note, since your um, listeners are focused on the next economy, the new economy, and how we're all co-creating that in the ways that we can, uh, one of the benefits of living in community is that it's a lot cheaper because you have shared resources and there's a certain economy of scale of buying many things in volume if you want to, um, and many communities do. So while it may not cost any less to buy in in terms of home ownership into an intentional community, although in really many rural areas it is really quite cheaper, but at least once monthly costs are quite a bit less often in community just because you're doing cooperative uh, economic ventures with others. Okay, so I'd like to tell you what I like to call the three aspects of a healthy, thriving community, but really I mean four. So please imagine a donut shape, and in the middle is the fourth thing that is the basic foundational thing for everything that I haven't mentioned what it is yet. And then maybe the outer part of the donut, or like a steering wheel, divided into three equal sections. And let's call them one, two, and three. So those three things are three things that I think that any um, organization that is member-led, whether it be a worker co-op or an intentional community, what they need to succeed and thrive. And one is to create what I call community glue, or you could call it the spirit of community, or you could call it the overarching vibe or energy of what we're all doing here. And it's how people have shared enjoyable activities together, um, just naturally as part of their work day or just naturally as a part of living together in a shared environment with a common purpose. And sometimes, though, in intentional communities, you can make shared enjoyable activities that you're doing on purpose, like parties and dances and, and skit night and movie night and improvisational theater and... Um, uh, checkers and chess and frisbee and volleyball and singing together, dancing together, chanting, drumming, jamming with music, um, children's play areas where the parents get together and the kids get together. Lots and lots of fun things people can do together in a community or in a member-led organization where the people just naturally are having a good time doing the thing they all love to do on for their purpose that they're doing it. And this tends to create a sense of such goodwill and then even neurologically and biochemically something happens that's really good to know about, which is that it tends to have people start secreting in their bloodstream oxytocin, the pleasure hormone, and that comes out it comes out into your bloodstream and then it gets used up right away, but then it gets secreted again and, and used up right away. So there's this ongoing sending it into yourself and feeling the signals and then using it up and sending it in. And what makes it happen? Well, 
shared enjoyable activities make it happen. And when you're having shared enjoyable activities, like it or not, you're creating lots of oxytocin. And that makes you feel trust for the people you're doing the activity with and a feeling of um, harmony with them and a feeling of gratitude toward them. Or rather, you just feel gratitude in your heart and you associate it with them, whether or not you're consciously thinking about this. So when you and I go play volleyball with a group of friends, we're not consciously thinking, and now I am secreting oxytocin and feeling trust and gratitude for these other people. Nevertheless, it's happening. And so I encourage member-led groups and intentional communities and everybody in that category to have a really good time with one another as often as they can afford the time to do it because it is building a very strong structure and foundation and basis for reducing conflict Yes. reducing conflict and making it much easier to resolve conflict when it does arise because there's so much trust created already. It's also very important to have a feeling of goodwill with the other people in your group and shared enjoyable activities do that. So I'm describing that one first. The next one is to have good process and communication skills. And really briefly, I mean that when you talk with one another on a daily basis or in a meeting or deciding something or any way you're doing things together with communication, that you have communication skills that at least make the interchange have a result that's neutral or that creates bonding, connection, and goodwill. But not having an interaction that creates bad will or painful feelings or anxiety, tension, um, fear, anger, disgust, the kind of things that happen to humans as they interact with each other sometimes. There are ways to learn ways to talk with one another that don't make conflict worse, that don't take difficult situations and escalate them into worse, but rather make things turn out better. One of these methods, the one that I highly recommend, is called nonviolent communication. It is so well known and so widely practiced around the world that I won't say much about it because I think a lot of your listeners probably absolutely know what it is. The other thing what I mean about good process and communication skills is not just ways of talking that create more goodwill and more sense of connection with the others in the group, but um, that you, you have uh, literal process things you do, like sitting in a circle and picking a number out of a hat and one who gets the number wins the option to tell some stories about their life and the other people listen to the stories like things that were really frightening or meaningful or joyous or just really intense so that people get to know each other better or some other kind of thing like story night where you go around and share a little bit about each of yourselves that other people might not know. Things to get to know each other better. One of these things is when you resolve conflict, which can result in a lot of goodwill, not to mention resolving the conflict. There are different conflict resolution methods, but the one I really, really recommend right now is called restorative circles. And most nonviolent communication trainers know how to teach it and to administer it and know how to teach a community or a member-led group how to, how to use it. It involves a series of meetings between the parties to the conflict and others that they invite to be invited to help share in the restoration process. And it's highly, highly recommended by people who found it to be the best thing they've ever done in terms of resolving conflict. So this second part of the what I call the three aspects, good process and communication skills, the only two things anymore that I recommend are nonviolent communication and restorative circles or any other circle process for getting to know each other better. Well, if you have really good communication skills, you'll have far less conflict. If you have a whole lot of community glue, you will have far less conflict. If you have really good communication skills, that alone creates community glue. It creates goodwill. And so these two things are mutually reinforcing. The third one is mutually reinforcing with these other two, and that is effective project management. So a, a business, a nonprofit organization, a worker co-op, a political or environmental activist group, or an intentional community, they all need to um, man have management. Um, management meaning they know how much money they have, how much resources of labor and energy and time they have. They know how to uh, create proposals to themselves about how to 
how to um, administer that, and they do, and they work it out, and they know how much money, time, energy, and labor they have. They know what work tasks are needed to be done and who will do them. They might need to pay property taxes and liability insurance and have other kind of bills. They might need to keep track of their money in such a way that they are always ahead of the curve. They understand their own cash flow projection. They stay inside their budget. They know how to make a budget when they have to answer emails or phone calls or letters or do things with people from the outside or communicate internally. They know how to do it. They have something in place to do it. Usually this would be people volunteering their labor on these tasks or maybe being paid a small part-time salary for a small part-time job. That's what often happens in intentional communities, like they've got a bookkeeper, for example, who works very, very, very part-time. Anyway, efficient and effective project management, when done well, itself reduces uh, a it produces um, community glue. People feel good when things are going well, it, and, it, and it increases the goodwill between people and reduces the need for conflict resolution. What is the one in the middle? The one in the middle, in my opinion, is whatever self-governance process the group has, and that would include decision-making, but it's more than decision-making. It's what tasks and work tasks and things do we need to do and who's going to do them, and how do we propose to ourselves what we do, how we spend our time, money, and energy, and how do we decide through our decision-making process. Governance allows you to do the effective project management. When it's done well, your project is managed well, and you have more community glue and less conflict. When your governance gets stuck, doesn't work well, often you don't get the job done in your project management, your ongoing project management, and it creates ill will and people feel disgusted and you need a whole lot of conflict resolution and people don't even want to go to the potluck or the volleyball game because they're so discouraged. So that's why I consider that middle thing, that that circle in the middle of this pretend donut mm -hmm. chart, um, the thing that underlies and is foundational for everything else. So once again, quick overview with governance and self Self-governance and decision-making is the basic foundational thing. The three aspects are, in my opinion, good processing communication skills, effective project management, and creating community glue. Yeah, yeah this is very resonant with some of the observations that we hear from some of the organizations that we work with in the context of lift economy and in pursuit of growing the next economy. And so, so some of our listeners have been, uh, will be, they might use a different taxonomy, for example, community glue, they might call uh, organizational cultural investments, uh, investing in culture, shared meals, uh, celebration, happy hours, or some organizations do things like walking or surfing together, or group meditation, these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes those, uh, uh, those types of investments, and they are investments either of time or energy, sometimes of resource, sometimes of resources. Uh, they're so contrary to normal business as usual organizational culture that they get marginalized and then left off and seen as a cost center. Whereas what I'm hearing you say is that if we actually invest in these things or, or consciously create the spaces for community glue to occur, we end up with ultimately more um, efficacy, more efficiency, more connection, uh, more resilience as an organization and essentially less conflict. Um, with conflict as one of the causative agents of, you know, friction and lack of efficiency um, and frustration. C uh, communication skills uh, in most of the next economy context gets marginalized down to or discounted down to zero. Um, and so there's not a lot of investment in that. What we see in next economy companies is they're actually interested in personal growth and development of the individuals of the organization and they'll actually create training and opportunities to grow in our skills and being able to communicate with each other in some type of either circle facilitated formats or just even our personal skills like nonviolent communication. Um, but it's still a rare thing. It's still an emerging concept in next economy organizations. Um, we're looking at seeing more of that. And the effective project management, a lot of businesses kind of get the value of having operational systems in place, clear uh, roles and responsibilities. What, what tends to fall off the map there is transparency. 
Um, and that relates to what you said holds it all together is kind of how we make decisions and community government governance, which is uh, a big growth area for um, businesses, organizations, co-ops is uh, having very clear methods for making decisions and agreements. And it's really those structural components that come to mind. And I'm wondering if we could maybe, you could respond to any of that if you'd like. I was just kind of using some of the jargon and taxonomy that might be familiar to some of the uh, business community that listens to um, this podcast. But this, uh, this idea of um, structures and how conflict emerges, I also know that I've gained a tremendous amount of insight from you and your work in understanding kind of the crucial structures that can potentially be antidotes to conflict. I'm wondering if maybe you could also share about that. Um, that would be very valuable, I think, to the listeners. Sure. Um, I agree with everything you said in that really well-functioning worker co-ops or other kind of co-ops or organizations or member-led businesses and so on will do things with different names, but it does create glue or community culture in the place. And that um, the, these things I've mentioned are sort of true across the board for these different kind of organizations, and the place that things fall down is in transparency. I mean, the lack of transparency. So... Um, yeah, why don't I say a little bit about my very favorite um, governance process, which has as one of its three great principles, transparency. So if you could imagine a mind map that we will draw in our minds and hopefully see, even though this is all audio, um, what is sociocracy? If we put a circle in the center and it's sociocracy, well, it's a governance and decision-making method. And um, if there, we had a circle with an arrow going to it, and we'd say, what is the purpose of it and what are the values that lead to it? Well, the purpose is uh, organizing work tasks, but organizing them in such a way that we end up with a happy, goodwill, thriving, harmonious organization. So we could say in a nutshell, organizing work tasks for a harmonious organization, and then there's these three things we could draw that are going towards that, which are its three values and practices, and the first one is transparency. That means all of us in our co-op or business or uh, political or environmental organization or intentional community, we all know what our budget is, how much money we are spending or have spent, what our different teams or committees, which in sociocracy are called circles, um, what what they are currently doing and working on, how much time and energy they've just devoted to something or shall be devoting, what things are they considering, how much money have they spent. Nothing is um, secret, and that tends to remove a whole lot of conflict because people can't project their worst fears or they can't be all in denial about different things going on. They just know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to choose to keep up with everything, but they can if they want to. So transparency, that's a really big one. Another one is equivalence of voice, which means in any given um, circle or committee or team that you're in and you're organizing your work tasks for the things that you do in that committee, well, um, you have an equivalent voice in creating the policies and deciding the policies that organize your work. There isn't a boss and the rest of you do what the boss says. There isn't a hierarchical top-down thing. Um, you all together with equivalent voice decide what you do and how you do it and uh, who does what and so on. Um, and what policies you have that guide your work. You can assign one of your people in there to be like a straw boss when you do actual work activities and coordinate the work or not. It would be your own choice, and everybody would equivalently, with equivalence of voice, decide that. And the last one is um, effectiveness and efficiency. That is, I'll just call it effectiveness. We, we want to get the job done, organize the work well, know who's doing what when, make sure we're keeping track of it, do it well, have some course correction if we make mistakes and then put it back together again in a better way, do continuous improvement. And so our organization is effective. So once again, what's the purpose? Organizing work tasks for harmonious uh, organization, what are the three values and practices that lead to it, effectiveness, equivalence of voice, and transparency. So then it's 
really big on feedback loops, which sounds like engineers, but really this is what it means. In proposals, in meetings, when we create a proposal, we put wording in the proposal for how we're later going to measure and evaluate the proposal after it's implemented, knowing very well that in the one or more future times in future meetings, when we talk about it again, evaluating how is it going, is it doing what we wanted it to do, you know that you can keep it, change it, or throw it out. So you create proposals where you can change it or throw it out if possible. This is not true when the tree branch falls through the roof and you have to fix the roof because you're not going to throw that one out. You're going to keep the roof repaired, but it, it has to do with p policies about how you do your work. So when you make proposals, you know that it doesn't have to be set in stone because you'll have an opportunity later that you yourselves can evaluate how well it's doing and see if you want to change it any based on real life feedback. The way you use that in selecting people for roles is you help each other with feedback on how you're doing in your role so that people in roles can get continuously better in how they do it. How you do that in meetings is at the end of the meeting, you evaluate the meeting to see how did we do in today's meeting? Is there anything we do better and differently next, next time? So your meeting process can continuously improve. So the next really, really big thing in sociocracy is the feedback loops that's built into everything. And it's just words in a proposal or ways you talk to each other. You don't have to be an engineer or a scientist to use them. Um, then there's the circular structure where you have big committees or circles where people have a real specific function. They're called functional circles, and they do a specific thing. And they can make small daughter circles if they want to to do a more concrete, specific thing. Like let's say there was a circle in an organization for um, – promotion of the organization and then they made a little daughter circle called website and blog and another daughter circle called newsletter. You see what I mean? You you make the more concrete, specific things, little tiny circles of one or more people doing a very specific job, but you keep your eye on all of it. And then in the very middle of all this, you have something called a general circle where the main functional circles send two representatives and they together do creating circles, coordinating circles, keeping their eye on the big picture and longer term planning. And all these roles have term lengths, and you have really fair elections with equivalence of voice in each circle for creating their representative. So if you're not doing that role as representative to the general circle this year, you might be next year, and you can always nominate yourself, and that's considered completely legit. So what you have is you have a structure of circles. Each circle, it's very clear what thing you're doing, very clear area of responsibility, and very clear ongoing objectives or aims for that circle. Then there's five things you do, six things you do in the circle meetings, because the people in a circle do work. Sometimes they have quick, short, informal, and frequent work meetings, but then they have these larger, longer, bigger, more formal meetings that happen more, less often called circle meetings or policy meetings. This is where the people with equivalence of voice decide policies for their area, for their thing that they're doing, and they've got They've got six things they do. One is to evaluate proposals they made before to see how they're operating. Do we keep it, change it, or throw it out? Um, and then they do creating proposals, considering and deciding proposals, and that is similar but dif different than consensus. It's called consent with an NT, consent decision-making, and it's got all the benefits of consensus and none of the downsides, and I just love it. And then there's three other things they do besides creating proposals and considering them. There's selecting people for roles and helping people get better in their roles with role improvement feedback and consenting to circle members. People don't just volunteer and join your circle without your um, saying yes or not at this time, thanks, or hey, we're all full up right now, maybe in the future, or, or actually, no, thank you. You, you get to decide. So you have a whole lot of control over who you get to work with because you get to work with folks whom you can get along well with and who tend to understand how to do your governance method and understand the mission and purpose of your organization and of your specific circle. So that's sociocracy in a nutshell, equivalence, transparency, and uh, effectiveness. That's why I love it. Great. Yeah. And thanks for giving us an overview of sociocracy. The 
these dynamic governance processes and systems in the next economy kind of uh, context. There are a few that are emergent that uh, share a lot of uh, similar principles and uh, values in, in their expression. And I think uh, we see a lot of them emerging um, either in piecemeal or more comprehensive sociocracy is something that uh, Lyft Economy we think of as one of the more comprehensive uh, governance uh, systems um, that we've seen, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners are interested in that. I'm curious if we could turn towards the um, this kind of antidotes for structural conflict, because sure. uh, a lot of organizations we see um, moving into the next economy are maybe experimenting with more communitarian values and really trying to have a more democratic and inclusive uh, environment for producing goods and services, maybe even focusing on personal growth and development. And still, yet, uh, conflict emerges, and we see a lot of patterns as to uh, diagnosing maybe why and where the conflict comes from. But uh, I've gained, personally, a lot of insight from uh, from you and your work uh, in terms of your observations of what happens in communities. And so I'm curious if you could walk us through some of the things that you see as really crucial um, uh, in consideration of structural conflict. I'll be happy to. Um, by the way, you said the term dynamic governance a bit ago, and that is another name for sociocracy in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's called dynamic governance, dynamic self-governance, or sociocracy. And by the way, I teach it online, and so that. So when people say, hey, we don't want you to fly all the way out here to do a workshop, but we'll take your online course, well, I'm available for that. Wonderful. So let's go to what I um, came up with when I was writing my book, Creating a Life Together. I'll tell you, Kevin, I was looking at 90% of the new communities that were trying to get started, first in Colorado, where I lived, and then all throughout the West, and then all throughout the country. Later on, I found out it was international. But I, I found 90% of them failing, mm -hmm. and often failing in conflict and heartbreak, and sometimes even in lawsuits and in court. <laughs> and this was very, very uh, shocking to me and heartbreaking, and I felt really dismayed. So naturally, I thought, well, what are the, the communities that are not falling apart? What are they doing? Are they doing something different? Uh, and what are the communities that are feeling doing? Are they are they doing something specific um, that I can uh, that I can learn from? And sure enough, sure enough, this is just astonishing. Um, I found that they were doing different but opposite things. Mm -hmm. The ones that were succeeding were doing certain things, mm -hmm. and the ones that were failing were not doing those things. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, people ought to know about this. I said, somebody ought to write this down. Well, you know how the giant finger in the universe swivels around and points to you mm -hmm. when you say somebody ought to? <laughs> I mean, did you say somebody ought to have a new economy podcast, right. you know, and then the finger points to you, Kevin, you know? So the finger is pointing at me, and I thought, holy mackerel, I better learn how to write a book. Well, then I got the sort of inner guidance. You already know how to write a book because you can write magazine articles because you're the editor of Communities Magazine, and you just write multiple articles and column chapters and, and you've got a book. So I did. And what I thought was was that the things the groups were doing that worked were preventing what I called, because for lack of a better term, structural conflict, meaning all this conflict would come up in these groups, either in their first few meetings or after they'd been meeting many weeks or many months or in the first few years or even when they were in the process of trying to buy their land, this conflict would come up that didn't that wasn't actually interpersonal mm -hmm. that is to say it didn't come up because somebody was behaving like that and somebody was behaving like that and you shouldn't act like that and why don't you learn some communication skills and what's wrong with you and hey we need mediation that wasn't it that would actually occur on top of it but what was underneath was that they didn't have certain really important things in place mm -hmm. They, they just didn't know they needed these things because how could they know? There was no structure or step-by-step -step guide to how to start an intentional community in a Western nation, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because we live in nations, us in Canada and other parts of the Western world, we live in nations where 
it's a doggy dog rat race, win, lose thing, and it costs a lot to buy land, and you're not supposed to do cooperation, you're supposed to do competition, and hey, what about the rat race? You have to be a rat in the rat race, and so everything you'd want to do to create an intentional community goes against the grain of the very culture that you're embedded in and subject to, mm -hmm. so what the heck are you going to do? So I thought, somebody needs to write this down, and here's what I found out. What you need to do is about to do about eight things, and uh, one of them is what we just talked about, create community glue, take every opportunity to create shared enjoyable activities. And another one is something we just talked about, which is uh, please learn and practice good communication and process skills. And once again, I'll say, let's go learn good old NVC, nonviolent communication, and restorative circles. And then all of the other things uh, fall into the um, category of effective project management. So one is identify your community's shared vision, the better world we'd like to see in the future, and mission and purpose, which is what we're going to do in our community to help bring that about, mm -hmm. and your shared values from which these things will arise. Mm -hmm. And I should add in your shared lifestyle choices, mm -hmm. because we have to make kind of very transparent and clear. Are we vegans, vegetarians, omnivores, or do we have dietary freedom and we welcome all dietary styles? Do we have a particular spiritual practice, for example, or do we welcome any and all of them? Do we have a particular this or that? And, or, or what is our this or that? And like, make it clear what your shared lifestyle choices are. Make it clear what your values are. And then the purpose, which is, why are we here? What is this community for? Anyway, that's hugely important. In my book, I call that your vision, but what I really mean is a combination of your vision, better world in the future, mission and purpose, what we're doing, and shared values, shared lifestyle. Yeah. Another one that's really important is to have a clear and thorough membership process whereby we say, this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it. This is where we are in our location. This is how close we are to services like the copy shop and the UPS box and, you know, all the things we might need to know. And also, this is what it costs to join us. And this is what it costs every year to be a member. And this is our membership process. And this is, uh, do you get your money back if you leave or not? And we put all that on our website so that you have everything totally transparent. And then when you become a member, you go through the steps of membership. And we've got it right there on the website. What are the steps and how do we decide this? Oh, my gosh. Make it clear. Make it transparent. Let's mm -hmm. have no big secret guesses and wondering anything, mm -hmm. especially how much does it cost to join? Put it right there in black and white or mm -hmm. green and yellow or whatever your website looks like for people to read when they go to your website. Is it a big secret? No, don't make it a big secret. Here's another one that's really, really important besides membership and shared purpose. Um, have clear agreements in writing. What are your agreements? What have you agreed to? Because the new incoming person who will be a new incoming founder or a new incoming member, they're going to need to know what agreements they're joining and agreeing to agree to, even though they weren't there when the agreements were made. Mm -hmm. That is to say, they're joining your group your group isn't joining them. They have to agree to what you've agreed to. And if they don't agree, well, maybe they should be a neighbor and come over and visit, but don't join you because mm -hmm. they don't agree with that. Right. Here's another one. Help people stay accountable to agreements, meaning when people have agreements about parking, quiet hours, children, pets, the dog policy, the cat policy, um, all kinds of things like that. Not only do we let our new incoming people know these agreements, but we help our members stay accountable to them. In mainstream culture, uh, there beside, outside our borders of this community, we've got jail terms and punitive punishing fines and damages and court costs. What do you do in a community? You have ways that are gentle, courteous, and not shaming or blaming, but nevertheless do induce the person to keep the agreements in case they happen to forget and get off track. And um, I talk about that more in my book and workshops and so on, like courteous, goodwill ways to help people stay accountable. Um, the last two things are things we talked about in the three aspects. Um, number eight, I say, is learn the necessary head skills and heart skills. Well, the heart skills, that's easy, how to create community glue, how to have good processing communication skills. And the head skills is all this management stuff, you know. But the, the biggest thing of all 
I call is a fair and participatory governance and decision-making process. Mm -hmm. And the two that I highly recommend are, if you're going to use consensus, to use the in-street consensus method, in like the letter N, and Mm -hmm. that's the name of a community in Davis, California, that invented a new and better way to use consensus that I highly recommend, and I also teach it, and or sociocracy, which Mm -hmm. I've just described. Mm -hmm. So here's the eight crucial structures that I suggest groups have in place or put in place right away when they're starting an intentional community to prevent structural conflict, and they are shared vision, mission, purpose, values, and lifestyle choices, fair participatory governance and decision-making, a clear and thorough membership process, community glue, clear agreements and writing, and helping people stay accountable to agreements, good process and communication skills, and what things do you need to learn with your heart, and what things do you need to learn with your head, and how can you do both, because you need both. Wonderful. And I really appreciate you sharing those uh, in, in detail. And it uh, you know clearly relates to the aspects that we've already covered of what makes healthy communities. And for a number of the organizations kind of growing into the next economy, they'll recognize a lot of these, the the vision, mission, and purpose, and, and the values definition, uh, the explication, the articulation of those, um, so that there's something to opt into, um, is definitely something that uh, we see as the root of a lot of uh, uh, emergent conflict in organizations when they bypass or skip or marginalize that initial aligning activity um, and actually reinvest in it o- over time to make sure that it's alive, that, that feedback process that you described earlier. Um, yeah. Revisioning, rearticulation. This idea of membership process and orienta- orientation and what uh, a, a new team member, a new member, a new employee even is opting into is something that uh, we find as very critical. Uh, orientation as a concept is uh, sometimes marginalized and discounted in terms of the value of it. And uh, we see that as becoming one of the root causes of uh, conflict down the road. And then the rest of the things we, we've definitely covered, and I love this, it's a really vital articulation that you've made of ways that uh, in through what we would call design, organizational design, uh, we can take these um, structures and incorporate them um, at the outset and then keep them alive and then revision as needed. Um, and we have, of course, implicit in those structures is a process to do the revisioning. And so you kind of have everything you need to do to uh, put the boat on the water and then steer the ship um, through uh, these troubled times. And I guess that's one of the last questions that I have for you is how how are you feeling now? This uh, this like embarrassing <laughs> um, statistic for humanity that ninety uh, percent of our emergent new endeavors to try and uh, live with some shared uh, resources and just uh, with some communitarian values, um, we we tend to fail. Um, it's embarrassing, it's sad also, and and disheartening um, when I when I hear that, and it resonates with my observations. And um, I'm wondering how you feel if you feel optimistic, or as you look into the future, what what, what thoughts occur to you when? Um, I guess it's that maybe it's the 10% <laughs> that, that do work. Maybe that's where uh, to, to put our attention on. And I certainly you've done that. But I'm just curious what your thoughts are and how you feel about the, the future. Well, I think you're asking me how do I <laughs> feel about the way things are with humanity and relative to how it could be if we lived mm. a more cooperative way or lived and worked or both a <laughs> more cooperative way. And do I feel discouraged? And what's my feeling about this kind of cooperative, better process for the future? Is that is that your question, Kevin? Yeah, that's fair. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, thanks to people like some of your former guests, like Charles Eisenstein and, and various folks who are focusing on a more spiritual, effective, and cooperative way to do economics in the context of human relationships and in the fact that there are many worker co-ops and owner co-ops, and by the way, some of them use sociocracy, um, I, I feel really good about the trend towards that beautiful future that I am both envisioning, 
praying for, feeling grateful for in advance in order to bring it on, and also because I do feel grateful, and uh, but I'm helping to create in my own very small way. And so that's one thing. And the second thing is regarding intentional communities. I have never seen so many people hmm. on the gro- – here's what I call, I call it the growing edge of green. Well, that's kind of a silly name, but it oh, alliterates anyway, and it means – in our culture, there's very, very, very mainstream culture people, and there's more what you might call holistically oriented progressive people. And somewhere in there, there's this edge, and I see it like a shoreline or the edge of a beach or something like that, where these folks would love to live in an intentional community. There's a hunger for it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> or work in an organization like those that your listeners are involved in or would like to be involved in or both, Mm -hmm. and they don't even know intentional communities exist. Mm -hmm. And when they find out they exist, they say, really? Such things exist? And then then let's say that they're focused on and concerned with and interested in the issues of ecological sustainability. And then they find out that there are eco-villages that are trying to learn how to do that better with our current technology and our current ways, including low technology like my little homemade out of plywood in a five-gallon plastic bucket composting toilet, like you know, low technology plus technology in general, and and they and they and they find out that there are eco villages forming and existing in cities and towns and semi-rural areas and rural areas, and if and then they find out that the rural ones are also creating a sustainable economy, a topic you and I could talk about sometime if you like, in their own intentional community. How do you create a village-scale economy here? out here in the country where we folks here will have income and have jobs that we create ourselves in our own cottage industries right here on site. And they find out that that exists and they go, my God, that exists. You mean there are eco-villages, they, they say the word strangely, they've never heard the word, that actually exist. Then they come and visit one like ours or the others in various parts of the Western world and they just can't believe it. And their jaw drops and they start to cry. And then they join. And so there have never been so many people interested in my community as right now. Mm -hmm. There have never been so many inquiries into my community from the people along this edge, the growing edge of green, people who would love to do this if they only knew it existed, and then they find out and they're so glad. And there's never been as many people inquiring over to the Fellowship for Intentional Community, the FIC, to learn about communities or going on to the IC.org website or the directory.ic.org website or the communities on dot ic dot org website that's communities magazine and the co housing network has never had so many inquiries that's coho that's cohousing dot org that's their website and my website my website is diana leaf christian dot org and the leaf has an e on the end of it and christian is spelled like the religion so diana leaf christian dot org my website there's never been so many people going there and I think that means people really really want to know about this learn about this, and if they can, get involved in it. And that's just intentional communities. What about all those worker co-ops and co-working organizations and all those organizations you're involved with, Kevin? Um, It's all growing bigger, I think, and that gives me hope. So glad to hear you say that. And collectively, we tend to refer to that all as the next economy, one that works for the benefit of all life. I'm so grateful for the time you've taken to contribute to the next economy now. And I do look forward to another time to catch up with you again about either uh, eco-village or village-scale economy or so many other things that I'm sure we could talk about. Um, and I'm really grateful for the time and attention that you've given to the the study, your work, the this journalistic approach of understanding what's working, what's not working, uh, what efficacy looks like in this very important uh, emerging uh, set of structures and systems that are very important for the future of humanity. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, staying in connection with you and uh, pursuing that joy. I I love that we started with joy and um, we can uh, maybe end with joy. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you. Would it be possible for me to share my my uh, email address? Please. It's Diana at IC dot org. D I A N A at IC like intentional community or ice cream dot org. 
So thank you so much, Kevin. Thanks for the wonderful work that you do. It's been a pleasure to talk with you on your podcast. That concludes this episode of Next Economy Now. And now on to our mini interview with Doug Bistry, CEO of Clearinghouse CDFI. Okay, welcome, Doug, to this interview series, the Next Economy Now podcast. And you know, for listeners, I think one of the reasons I'm excited about Clearinghouse CDFI is that you're a lot different than other financial institutions. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we were sort of moving directionally towards is, is um, you know, some of the practices at Clearinghouse. And, you know, one of the things that I, I think probably the reason I first heard about you, you and your work and uh, my, your colleague there at uh, Clearinghouse was you, because you're a certified B Corp. And can you tell us about sort of how you found out about B Corp and what, what, you, what value you found in that community? Well, you know, what's really interesting with us is as a for-profit CDFI for many, many years, we were viewed as sort of a wolf in sheep's clothing, uh, i.e. the nonprofit CDFI world uh, didn't trust us. They thought, well, there, you know, you can't be a for-profit and, you know, be concerned about people and, and any for-profit is really out to just make money. And so... Um, and in fact, what's ironic is our trade association, the Opportunity Finance Network, uh, barred our membership for the first four years uh, because we were, you know, one of those evil for-profit CDFIs. But um, uh, so when, when the B Corp concept, when I first heard of it, I said, wow, this is great because here's something for for-profit companies where we can really share with the world our principles and how concerned we are about everything more than just simply making money. And so I, I was, you know, hook, line, and sinker, uh, completely uh, bought into the idea of, of going through the process and becoming, uh, you know, certified as a B Corp and, and, and doing everything we had to do and really, you know, taking a long, hard look at it because it was always in our DNA. And it was, it, it wasn't, you know, at the time we applied, we didn't change much. We didn't change anything probably early on. I mean, since then we've done things to try to improve our score, but, you know, early on it was really just, uh, Hey, this is who we are. This is what we're doing on a daily basis. You know, we, we care about, uh, uh, the environment. We care about our governance. We care about community customer service and how we treat our workforce and in every loan we make has a tangible community benefit. You know, we're, we're certainly a B Corp. And so that was really what um, was my impression at the beginning. And, and it's really what's stuck with me and, and why we're so excited to be a B Corp. And I think one of the most innovative things I've seen that you do is this the internal B Corp team. And you're, um, you also have a, a, an internship program, right? Like B, B Fellows, or I, I can't remember what the exact name is. It's called Be Bold. Be Bold, yes. Yeah, Be Bold. And it's uh, named uh, after one of my mentors, Alan Baldwin, uh, who ran Orange County Community Housing Corp. And uh, yeah, we, we pick a uh, low-income student, uh, usually from uh, Santa Ana School District or Garden Grove School Dist District, and uh, we uh, provide them a paid internship uh, in the summer between either their sophomore and junior or their junior and senior year in high school. And we've had some really fantastic students. And the idea is to help them uh, have some additional, uh, uh, additional material for their college resume, as well as to give them some practical uh, learning experience in the workforce. So it's been a great program for us. And where can folks learn more about Clearinghouse and, you know, say if there's any investors who are interested, what's the best way for them to get in contact? We have a great website that has a ton of information, including our financials. Um, it is www.ccdfi.com. Again, that's ccdfi.com. And uh, a lot of information there. There's contact numbers. Um, I'd be happy to. Uh, to talk to anybody that uh, is serious about uh, investing or working with us. And also, you know, we're looking for projects to lend, um, you know, good projects. And so in, in our service areas, uh, California, Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, and all of Indian country throughout the United States. So if anyone is aware of an unmet credit need that has, uh, 
good community impact or, you know, uh, often our loans are made to entrepreneurs, uh, people of color or, or members of groups that have been disenfranchised. And uh, if anyone is aware of loans, boy, we'd love to hear from them as well. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.